Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's talk on exploring farmhouse Wednesdaydale cheese. It's, for me, one of the great success stories of farmhouse cheese in Britain. I think this picture kind of captures it. This was a book in the 1930s when we were losing all our kind of small cheese makers making on a farm, making real expressions of where they were farming and where they were cheese making. And our business, when we set up the Courtyard Dairy 10 years ago, what we wanted to do was to champion and support farm-made cheese, made with raw milk on the farm and traditional recipes. We set up in North Yorkshire and we set up with about 25 cheeses and our remit was to kind of encourage new cheese makers to set up and support those that were going. One of the great shames when we set up is that within 35 miles, there wasn't one farmhouse cheese maker. There wasn't one cheese maker making on the farm with their own milk. And I think one of the great success stories now is that we can lay claim to that there's four who make cheese within 35 miles on their farm with milk. And Wednesdaydale's a real success story as part of that, I think. Wednesdaydale is an iconic and historic British cheese. You know, it's been around for a thousand years, pretty much. Um, so it was first really documented about the 1300s, but that was really the, the, the effort of making Wednesdaydale was after William the Conqueror came and he set up monasteries in this region and it encouraged them to make cheese. And then the monasteries outsourced that to the local farms, and the local farms made cheese. And for almost a thousand years, Wednesdaydale was made in this region on the farm. Now, I talk about this region really because we are in the Yorkshire Dales. And traditionally in this region, there was lots of farms who made cheese. And the cheese that's most famous is obviously Wednesdaydale itself. Um, and it takes its name from the Dale of Wednesdaydale. You know, upper and lower Wednesdale here. But there's actually hundreds of dales. You get Garsdale, Ribblesdale, Wharfdale, Nidderdale down here, Swaledale. And together they're called the Yorkshire Dales. Now, the name of the cheese in this region is quite often called Wednesdale. And there's no doubt there's a lot made within this Wednesdale region. But the reason, like many cheeses, it takes its name from the, 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 the place where it was sold. So up around here in Laban, which is a local uh, town, was the great cheese fairs. So traditionally we made cheese in the spring and the summer and we sold it in the autumn. And the majority of cheeses from the Dales were sold in Laban in Wensydale. So like a lot of places, it takes its name from the cheese place where it was sold, not necessarily from being in exclusively made in Wensydale. And where we are here in Ribblesdale, um, we're surrounded by farms that used to make cheese. You know, within a, a 10 mile radius, I can think of about eight old cheese stone presses on the edges of farms. And, and that's part of our history of this area. One of the great shames within British cheese was that decline of farmhouse British cheese, which I'm sure has been covered on other, on other talks. <clears throat> but Wensleydale is very evident. So Wensleydale went from 150 years ago, 2,000 farms producing farmhouse Wensleydale. By 1957, there was none. So there's a factory up at Hawes, which is a fabulous factory, which makes commercial standardised Wensleydales, and it does an absolutely fabulous job at making uh, uh, a factory made Wensleydale and they taste absolutely brilliant. However, those individual nuanced cheeses that are made on a farm, that are, that are real reflections of those places, had died out. And Wensleydale was once kind of one of the most historic cheeses of Britain, you know. Um, there's a couple of quotes that, that I love from the 1930s and 1940s. You know, the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries say that a good Wensleydale is soft and flaky, will spread like butter, can have delicate blue veining, um, and then there's a woman from Valchique who said one of the great Epicurean disasters uh, is, is the gradual disappearance of traditional blue and soft Wensleydale, owing to kind of replacement by this lighter texture, white Wensleydale. And what we're going to look at tonight um, is three Wensleydales that kind of really showcase the resurgence of farmhouse British cheese. So if we were doing this chat 10 years ago, I couldn't present to you as a Yorkshire man. I couldn't present to you here um, some farmhouse cheeses made in the Dales that are made on the farm, which is a historic British cheese. You know, it is part of Britain's history. It had died out completely. One of the great success stories is that we now have three cheesemakers who make within the Dales, Loonsdale, Nidderdale and Wensleydale itself, making on a farm, making with raw milk. And I think that's something to be championed and supported. I think it's also, for me, a great reflection of, uh, of farmhouse cheese making 
and why that's great. So hopefully some of you got the cheeses to taste alongside. And I think that's great because what we're going to look at is three cheeses that are made to the same recipe. They're made pretty much in the same area of the world, 20 miles apart, some of them. They're made all with raw milk. They're the same age and they're distinctly different. And that's kind of what I, I really like to kind of showcase is that when you go into a good cheese shop in France, you'll quite often see cheeses of the region and cheeses that are trying to be made the same, but they are distinctly different because they're reflections of the pasture, the equipment, that farm's routine, um, the little tweaks to the recipe, how they breed their cows, even if they're trying to make a, a fairly similar cheese. So yeah, a great success story of Farmhouse British Cheese in that 10 years ago, we had none of what is an iconic British cheese. And now we have three. And why the reason for Farmhouse Cheese, really, why the reason for the resurgence in Farmhouse Wensdale uh, and why the decline? Well, Farmhouse Wensdale is quite a unique little product. Um, it, it didn't industrialize in quite the same way as um, some of the down the west coast of the country. If you go from Lancashire down to Cheshire, down to the southwest, knowledge and expertise spread quite fast in the area. You follow that M6 road down. And when cheese making techniques started to kind of uh, revolutionize, um, we learned several things about how to make cheese within Britain that would make it faster, more efficient, and more stable. There were the use of more heat, uh, there were the use of more bacteria, and there were the use of more kind of mechanized process. And this makes kind of more consistent, standardized cheese. But Wensdale is kind of an outlier. It, it's a little bit further inland, and the land is challenging. You know, the farms traditionally in this area would have 10 to 15 cows, and they would make small individual cheeses not kind of like the big cheddars you would see, and they were made by hand and consumed locally. So it didn't kind of advance at quite the same rate. Although kind of in the 1900s, Leeds University started to send dairy consultants up into the, uh, the Dales to kind of revolutionize and start to change Wensdale cheese. And as a result, it, it, it did start to change. But luckily, we have quite a few people document how old fashioned Wensdale was made. You know, how we'd kind of milk still on the farm. We'd carry them in these old fashioned traditional bat cans. We'd make it with this old fashioned curd breaker. Um, it'd be hang up in bags to drain. Then it would be kind of crumbled by hand and then brined actually before left, left to mature. And some of these are documented. Um, we had a, a, a brilliant book that we managed to get our hands on some time ago, which uh, was from the Ministry of Agriculture, Farm and Fisheries. Um, published in the 1930s. And in here is how to make old fashioned Dale style cheeses. So when local farms came to us about eight years ago in the case of Philstone and said, we're not making money from selling liquid milk anymore. We're a small family farm. We want to diversify. We had kind of some of this documentation and we thought, brilliant, we can spearhead um, kind of a recreation of cheese the way it used to be made. So Wensdale had become a much more efficient product. Um, so eventually those me methods and knowledge spread across into the Dales. And one of the key catalysts to that method and knowledge spreading was the Second World War. So a lot of farmhouse cheese in Wensdale was still made on a farm in Wensdale. It was quite remote, quite stuck out um, up until the Second World War, really. And the Second World War cheese rationing Certain cheeses were allowed to be made, and um, they decided that Wensdale is a soft textured, kind of slowly made, fairly inefficient, small, unstable cheese, often naturally blue because it was unstable, was not um, suitable to go on the, on the ration book. And so they pulled all the Wensdale farmers together, and the Ministry of Food said that, look, I don't think we're going to put it on the ration book. And Kit Calvert, with all the farmers, um, was asked what they thought of the fact that Wensdale's production would stop for wartime rationing. And a classic Yorkshire response, so apparently one farmer just chirped up and went, nout. Um, and that was it, really. And they decided that what they would do is start to tweak the recipe in, in the kind of guise of what was happening anyways, which was to make it more stable and efficient. So they started to use more heat in production and more bacteria. And as a result, Wensdale became a tighter, close-knit texture cheese more acidic, more crumbly, more fresh, and a drier cheese. And it still broadly exists to that stage as this day, a fairly kind of crumbly, acidic, dry cheese. 
And that kind of, really, there was no point really, it doesn't really express the milk of an individual farm. So even though that enabled Winsdale to keep going and was key in, in, in that kind of resurgence, what it did do is kill these kind of individual expressions of cheeses. So it died out pretty much by 1957, the last farm producing Winsdale stopped. Uh, Winsdale continued and was kept alive as a cheese by Hawes Creamery, um, which still keep it alive on that kind of factory production to this day. So 10 years ago, eight years ago, Fellstone came to us and they said, we're interested in making a cheese. And I have all this books and all this knowledge of how Wednesday was made. And it's a cheese of this region. There was cheesemakers everywhere. And I thought this is a great opportunity to kind of spearhead this kind of resurgence. And I think that every small cheese shop, every cheesemonger and every cheese um, buyer should take a little bit of responsibility to try and spearhead resurgence of traditional cheeses in their region. I think what we call territorial cheese in Britain has a poor reputation in many regards because of those industrial process, we lost a lot of character. And um, <clears throat> a lot of the northern cheeses, Wensdale, Cheshire, Lancashire, are often not viewed as, as quality cheeses. And a lot of new cheesemakers tend to make what I would consider, you know, for want of a better word, Sexy cheeses that are smooth, they're creamy, they're often led by yeasts and moulds and bacteria which are added in. And there's nothing wrong with them, but the flavour of those cheeses, they're often continental styles, are really easy and approachable and sweet and creamy, and they're just really, really pleasant to eat. Uh, traditional cheeses from Britain have kind of been a bit neglected. Uh, but what these are, I think, is a true reflection of a farm. I would call these, I mean, Graham Kirkham, has a great uh, work for his Lancashire's, which is milk on a shelf. You know, they are not led by bacteria. They are not led by yeasts and moulds and other flavours that grow on them. They are literally reflections of that one place where they're made. And they're not big, powerful flavours, but I think they're complex, rich flavours that uh, should be appreciated. And I think that you'll find that if you ask many experienced cheesemakers their favourite cheeses with time, it's often these traditional territorial cheeses, which are associated with being mellow, but actually have a rich flavour. And I'm glad that we've seen people turn back to Wensdale, and I hope that we'll see other areas recreate their traditions. It's still a great shame that we only have one farmhouse producer of Lancashire cheese making with raw milk. We barely have two of Cheshire, you know, um, a couple of Caffili, you know, a couple of uh, raw milk blue cheeses from Nottinghamshire. Um, you know, there's five million people in Yorkshire alone. Surely we can support more than three family farms. They make about 18 a day. They make 32 a day. They make 10 of them a day, every other day. So this is not large production. So, so there we go. So about 10 years ago, Fellstone came to us and looking at diversifying. We gave them this old fashioned Wednesday recipe and we said, go away uh, and have a go at making that. And they did. And we'll talk a little bit about that in two seconds. And then about six years ago, Stonebeck came to us and they're the other side of Dales in Nidderdale and they were interested in going down a distinct route. So we kind of took a real responsibility to, to give them Wednesday recipes. To, they were interested in the history of the region and traditional native cows. We also put them in contact with other cheese mongers uh, like the Fabulous Nails of Dairy who could support them um, as well as us. And they decided to take this Wednesday recipe and make a Wednesday on their farm. And then about three or four years ago, Old One came on a cheese making course here at the Courtyard Dairy and then went back to their, their family farm and decided they would try and recreate Wednesday all there. And they're all broadly following the same recipe, but there is differences between them, which we're going to cover a little bit as we go through. We'll start with the Old One, because I feel at this moment in time, the Old One is probably the most reflection of what people would associate with a modern Wednesday. Um, uh, but that is going to change. So Old Rowan, you see here, they've been experimenting with various types. Um, the, the binding is going to change. The way they're making their cheese has changed. It's slowing down. It's becoming a lighter, fluffier cheese as they try and actually go kind of even more of a step back in cheese making techniques. So actually, as you taste Old Rowan here, you'll see the cheese be slightly different in three or four months. We've started to see it coming through now. And it's interesting and a really complex cheese. So if you want to have a little taste of the old one, if you've got the, the samples, and I'll show you, it's always nice to see the cheesemakers, I think. Um, so um, Sam and Ben Spence, they're third generation dairy farmers in Wensdale. Uh, they grew up in Wensdale itself. 
in, in Aysgarth. They then went to work in the fine world of accounting um, and uh, ended up uh, working for PricewaterhouseCoopers, but decided to kind of give up and return back to the farm. Now, at the time, their farm milk main went, mainly went to Wensdale Creamery um, uh, and was used to make a fabulous Wensdale farm there. But the price of milk forced them to diversify. Um, so nowadays, the business is run by Ben and his wife, Sam, who's really keen to business as well. And they decided to start selling liquid milk and they decided to start uh, making cheese on a small scale on the farm. They've now kind of moved off their family farm and are based in the town of Wensley. Um, Wensleydale is quite unique in that it's one of the few dales which isn't named after a river. So Ribblesdale is named after the river, river Ribble. You know, Swale Day is named after the river Swale. Wharfdale, Wharf, Nidderdale, River Nid. Wensleydale is named after the town of Wensley. So they've moved to the town of Wensley and they're on the Castle Bolton estate. And they've decided to try and take old fashioned Wensleydale recipes. And they were very well supported by the late, great David Hartley, who was responsible for. Um, keeping alive Wensleydale Creamery uh, at its height in the 1990s when even that factory looked like it would go by the wayside. And he encouraged them that we, we should have a farmhouse cheese made in Wensleydale, a true reflection. So they set about trying to make Wensleydale and they um, originally used more conventional bacteria, they used more conventional techniques, but with time they've slowed it down and have gone to kind of old fashioned bacteria within the cheese making. They still use a fairly heavy dose of heat within cheese making. And what that gives them is kind of, it's about six, seven weeks old. Um, it's kind of a, a more of a classic Wensleydale profile. It's quite crumbly, quite fresh, quite acidic, quite clean. But they are making with warm milk and they are not as aggressive as perhaps a factory produced Wensleydale. So a factory produced Wensleydale will take between two and three hours between rennet and mill and to make effectively. Whereas this is taking about four or five, so slightly longer, slightly more um, laborious. And as a result, you kind of get a slightly softer texture. You still get that clean freshness. I always think these northern cheeses have developed not to be kind of powerful big cheeses. And they've been developed to feed to the working classes in the north in the Industrial Revolution, kind of as, a, as an approachable everyday cheese, a cheese to be enjoyed underneath the cheesecloth in the center of the kitchen as it used to be, you know, uh, for lunch, for snacking on, almost like a tom within France or saint Nectaire. I think that's where they sit within the world. And, you know, a lot of Wensleydale originally went up to feed the mining communities in Durham or down to Leeds to, fill them, to feed the mill towns. Um, so that's old one. That's made by Sam and Ben Spence, kind of a fresh, clean, acidic, nice testiness to it. And I think a real great reflection of their farm and where they make. I'll give you a little sample of the next cheese. So the next cheese, I'll show you the pictures who make it, is made by Tom and Claire Noblet. So they're very interesting. They're up in a, a dale called Loonsdale, um, which is... Kirby Lonsdale, near to Kirby Lonsdale. So this is Tom and Claire. Now they're interesting that they have no history of family farming really. So they wanted to get into farming, but it's very difficult for a new farmer to get into farming if you don't have land, equipment, you know, uh, animals, which are all very expensive. However, there was a little farm on the edge of the, the Dales, between the Dales and the, and the Yorkshire and, and the Lake District, which were uh, an old couple, Max and Jenny, who wanted to give up, but their family didn't want to continue. And Max and Jenny didn't want to see their family farm broken up. Um, they farmed the same cows as, as what we call a closed herd for, for many generations. And they farm them on the side of the hills um, as they go over into, into Cumbria. And they saw that if they, their family wouldn't take over the farm, that would be it. They'd sell the herd, the farm would be broken up. Now, thankfully, there's a few things like uh, the farm share scheme, which enables Tom and Claire as people who want to farm to go and work for Max and Jenny and by working effectively, slowly buy their new animals that come through, you know, and effectively take a share in the farm with time. The more they work, the more the animals are theirs, the more the, the buildings they put up are theirs. And that's what's enabled Tom and Claire to do. It's enabled them to, to move into farming. It's great to kind of have that youth kind of come into their farm. So they're really interesting farmers. They um, milk and the majority of the milk is sold, um, but, and it, once a week, they have these four young children you can see there. Once a week, uh, the mother-in-law comes down and looks after the children, and Tom and Claire get involved in making cheese. Now, they came to us with a, a initial cheeses which were uh, not great, so we went away and, and they visited Graham Kirker, and we encouraged them to change their bacteria. And they make a cheese which fits in with the routine of their day, um, you know, but it's made on their farm with milk, slightly different milk. It's going across more Cumbrian side. 
Uh, it's a slightly slower drainage, takes slightly longer to make. Uh, and as a result, you kind of get this much more supple, almost bouncy texture. Um, we use similar bacteria to the old one now, but it, the rind I feel has a look, really great flavor. And this is again about six or, or seven weeks old. Interestingly, to make their cheese, they try and use the, the best quality cows that come to the milking parlor first. So they only use warm milk from the cows and they use the first 20 cows that come in, which they, they like the best of, uh, which are often the lower yield in kind of not, not producing quite as much intense milk, but kind of really rich milk. And that goes straight to the cheese making vat and they're making a little thousand litre vat. Traditionally cloth bind it. So all these cheeses you're tasting here are traditionally cloth bound. Now, the old fashioned way, um, we reckon to mature cheese, some people would argue, is to put cloth binding on the outside. Down in Cheddar, they put um, a lard on the outside of their cheese to stick their cloth on. The pig fat, and that's the way it's historically been done. Um, like this Cheddar here. In Lancashire, they use butter, and they stick the cloth on with butter. Um, now, the first two cheeses you've tasted there have stuck the cloth on with butter. But historically, there is no way a Yorkshireman was using butter or lard on the outside of their cheese to bind the cloth on. You know, it's just... It's just a waste of good butter, really. So the old-fashioned way to do it was to sew the cloth on. And Sally, who makes the stone bit, which we'll see in two minutes, still does that. And you can see the stitching sometimes on the cheese and um, where the cloth is sewn on by hand. So it's not bound on. She has a knitting needle and sews the cloth on by hand. And that's the way it would have been done. Old-fashioned Wednesday recipes were very slow and very laborious. They didn't use any heat in production. They used very little bacteria. They take a long time to make um, because the farmer's wife would pop in and out during the day. She'd be making cheese, like the pictures I showed you a minute ago, around the rest of the routine of the day, getting the children up, making breakfast, cleaning up, doing the jobs around the yard, like looking after the chickens and the young animals, making bread, making lunch. And cheese making would fit in all around that. It, in modern day Wednesday, two to three hours, old one, four hours, Fellstone about five, six, and old fashioned Wednesday, a lot longer before the salt is added. Um, and then in the evening, she'd sit in front of the fire and sew the cloth on. And often the cheeses would just be matured sitting there in the kitchen. We worked with a very famous cheesemaker well, called Fred Taylor. Fred Taylor started making cheese in the 1940s in Dent. And he used to get the milk from 15 different farms and he used to fee, fee, fill a 500 litre cheese making vat. Which, so that's from 15 farms. And he worked in Dent cheese making factory. And he started in the 1940s and ended in the 1990s. Or he made Wensdale all his life throughout various different factories and saw it change from being 15 farms for 500 litres, using no heating production, starting to use more heat and electric in production. The first people to get electric throughout the Yorkshire Dales were the cheese making, um, the cheese makers. It was before the national grid, first people to get electricity in Halls, in Dent, in Sedba, in, in Kirby Malzard was a cheese making factory and that electric provided more heat, allowed them to make more consistent, more standardized, drier, more stable cheeses. When I asked Fred many years ago, the great, and the great changes, I've done an interview with him many years ago within cheese making and how cheese making had changed. One of the things he did to me is he looked me in the eye and went, cheese making's changed a lot, but the biggest change I think in cheese is milk. And he says, the way we farm, is completely different to the way we farmed in the 1940s and 50s. We had much more diverse grasses. We had much more traditional um, pasture. And we had much more traditional native cows. And that, when you're making a farmer's cheese, expresses itself a lot more. And that's what you're seeing with the final cheese we're going to taste. Um, so the final cheese you're going to taste is made by Andrew and Sally Hatton. They're up on the top of Nidderdale. They only make this cheese seasonally. So they milk their cows once a day. They have an old-fashioned breed of northern short-horn cows. A um, very old-fashioned breed. They have about 20 of them, which is around about, you know, 15% of the global population. Once upon a time, every single farm in this region had this breed of cow. Nowadays, most of them have the black and whites, but every single farm has had this breed of cow because it can cope with the terrain. It, this cow, their cows live outdoors all year round. They don't milk them in the winter, but in the spring, they have a calf, the old-fashioned way, when there's more grass plentiful, when the calves and the mother can survive better, they have a calf in the spring. And traditionally, she, Wednesday was only made from May to the end of September. And that's what Andrew and Sally do. So they farm their cows out at pasture. They farm this old fashioned breed of cow. They only milk them once a day. These cows are on traditional hay meadows and they produce, and you can see this in their cheese, 
a really rich yellow milk, which gives a real kind of complexity to this cheese. If you're tasting this cheese, I think it has elements of kind of that French style, all those toms and those kind of uh, farmyardy kind of quite intense, rich mushroomy flavors coming through. But this is following the same recipes of the two. What you're seeing here is a reflection of that diverse milk up on the top of the knitted arm. And this is probably a more reflection of how Wednesday used to be than anything really because of the way that they farm and the way that they breed their cows. They've kept alive that native breed. They've kept alive those traditional pastures. They farm in a real ethical and sustainable way where, you know, with animals out on, on pastures, not bringing much onto their farm. They're really remote and a really great story um, of, of, of farmers recreating their traditional cheese. But that's it really, that's the end of the traditional Wensdale cheese tasting. And one of the things I really want to highlight is that when you buy these cheeses, you, uh, you are supporting those three family farms and you are keeping alive part of its social history, allowing that to regenerate. And also because of the way these farms farm with cows out of pasture, or with raw milk, traditional grasses, you know, you're doing better for the world when you eat this cheese. Every bite does better for the world. So what you're tasting really is a slice of history. Uh, and one of the great things about this is that you can taste laterally or horizontally, or not horizontally, laterally, doesn't matter. Um, you can taste now and see really the expression of farm cheese. Same age, starting with the same recipe, roughly the same equipment, same techniques, same bacteria, different farms, different routines, different pasture, different ways of breeding cows. And for me, this showcases farm horse cheese. Um, for me, it also showcases why Wednesday is a great cheese uh, and, and the complexity and diversity within farmhouse cheese. But they're only here as long as you eat their cheese. So thank you very much. Um, keep supporting farmhouse cheese and uh, keep championing because this is a real showcase of, of how we can turn a cheese which is historic to Britain around, one that had died out completely on a farm level for 50 years, but now has three producers doing an absolute fabulous job. Thank you very much. And if you're ever up in Yorkshire, please pop in. Um, we, we might give you a taste if you're feeling generous. But thank you very much. Cheers now.